Oliver Battle, thank you very much for your availability and for agreeing to join this conversation series within the Digital Markets Research Hub. Uh, we often hear from, from you that the, the, the immediate response of Google to the Digital Markets Act uh, proposal and entering into the force is the formula, quite an elegant formula, uh, competing compliance. While discussing in details some technicalities of the DMA, I propose we start with just maybe you highlighting the meaning of this of this formula. I'm happy to, and thanks a lot for inviting me to, to chat to you on this very sunny day. Well, when we think of um, competing in compliance, it probably has a, a number of components. I think that we look at this new piece of legislation, the Digital Markets Act, and we see within it, you know, a lot of complexity, uh, a lot of challenges, a lot of work that will need to be done, but also um, a lot of opportunity to apply your best and brightest minds to finding creative and pragmatic ways to achieve the outcomes that the legislator has decided on. Uh, we're past, I think, a debate around, you know, should the rules exist? In what form should the rules exist? The rules exist. They're written down. We have all have copies of them on our desk, well-funded copies at this point. And, and when I think at least about competing in compliance, I think, well, you know, what expertise, what ability, uh, what creativity do we have within Google that we can apply to these rules to come up with smart and innovative solutions? I don't really see the DMA necessarily as so different from some of the other products, challenges and problems that we take on and, and try and uh, innovate around. So I, I think that's really my attempt to encapsulate what we mean by competing compliance. In a similar vein, looking at these uh, new rules and regulations as, a, uh, as, a, as an opportunity to be competitive and creative, so too I think you have to look ahead and see this as an ongoing process. When we think about launching products, that's very much an iterative um, um, a process that you go through. So you, you know, you experiment, you provide ideas, you provide metrics, and you work with other stakeholders. And here there will be many: the commission, industry, academics, to to test and to see how it's going, and to improve and to deprecate some things and launch new things. So that's really how I, I think about it. Oles, it's uh, being competitive in compliance is treating a new regulatory framework, not as a uh, an imposition, as a, as, as a negative, but treating it as a, uh, a product challenge and an opportunity to, to deploy that broader bench of resource, which I believe is a, is a real competitive advantage for Google. And, and I'm proud of the work we do, and I'm, I'm proud of the work that we can do with the DMA. So should we infer from, from this answer that when we talk about you know, strategic planning, that the plan, or at least the original plan, the initial plan is to focus more on compliance and on the, of course, it's very difficult to, to imagine uh, a kind of a sensible, prudent uh, start of new, new, new important chapter or part of the digital competition policy with somehow declaring, manifesting your kind of uh, adv uh, adversarial interest of, of litigate every letter of law. I understand that you will start with compliance evidently, but from, from, from kind of more observatory perspective, do you think that the, the DMA contains many aspects which are kind of subject to litigation? Do you think that every word on the DMA is potentially lit, uh, kind of lit, litigious or it's, it's clearer and the, the gatekeepers will be less uh, interested in 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 trying to challenge every 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 provision of the DMA. I'm sure that you can find uh, lawyers in our community who are prepared to litigate every word of the DMA and every other piece of legislation that's out there. I'm sure that's true, and I'm sure there are people who um, are, would be very happy to do that. That the the job that I have at Google as the in-house lawyer is not to move directly to litigation, and to some extent, I see that as you know, very much the end of a, a long road where uh, there have been some failures by me in my ability to articulate to uh, Google, to the leaders, to the product designers, to the engineers, what needs to be done, and then to articulate back to uh, the commission and to other stakeholders what's feasible and what's sensible, what the, the, what the, the uh, implications might be of particular designs. Because I really think that that's 
the job of an in-house lawyer now. It's to parse the law, it's to find opportunities to, to build and to achieve the kinds of things that the DMA asks us to achieve. And litigation is really at the end of the road when you've been able to reach that kind of agreement. So although I can, you know, there are 23 rules and many pages of new rules, and you know, we all look at history and we see that you know legislation um, can be litigated, particularly when it's complicated. It's not really my focus at the moment. Um, I'm not thinking about how do I litigate this law. I'm thinking about how do we comply with it. How, and to use the, and I'm grateful that you think it's an elegant expression, but to use to use that again, how do we compete in compliance with these regulations? So that's at least my my mindset for now. Let's see how it all plays out. But that's I think how we have to. It's limited resource, limited energy for any of these kinds of uh, um, projects. So you have to be discerning. And in that discernment, you focus on now, I think, finding compliance, finding good agreement, finding agreed metrics, finding ways of measuring the success of this piece of legislation. So that's really where my focus is. And then we look at the kind of composition, not, not obviously not asking about uh, the numbers, obviously. I would be interested to learn, but it's not my direct question. Maybe the proportion of lawyers, economists, I don't know, engineers or data scientists, behavioral scientists, what is the, where do you, do you put up, uh, do, do you put emphasis? Is it more procedural or more technical, more choice architecture? Where, where do you think the, the main focus should be in terms of effective compliance? Well, look, I think the lawyers have a, 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 a lot of work to do in um, uh, doing what we normally do, which is uh, explaining a rule, a law in a language that technical people, non-lawyers understand. So I think there is there is a fair amount of work to be done there. As I say, as we all know, there's, there's 23 or so rules, and those need to be um, translated essentially. But I, you know, if I look at the efforts in the rounds, I think it is very much uh, weighted towards the latter, or less. That this is very much seen by us, at least, as a technical challenge. So we have to involve many, many engineers and many, many product designers and and behavioural scientists. Yes, you mentioned some of the sort of choice architecture uh, interface design that features in several of the provisions. So if you were as a lawyer can anticipate that you will need to demonstrate that a particular interface is neutral. I think that's the word that's used in Article, article 13, so uh, circumvention. If you need to demonstrate that, an antitrust lawyer living in London is not probably the right person to create the language, the vocabulary, the, the, the scientific evidence that can demonstrate whether that's been done effectively or not. I have to lean on a team of behavioral scientists, UX designers, and I have to bring them close to this process. I have to introduce them to the stakeholders in Europe. It's a big focus for me at the moment in particular. Uh, so we are pulling in large parts of the organization to do that kind of work. Um, consents is another area where we're doing a lot of work with our engineers and our and our product designers, our product managers, to conceive of the right way to comply with Article 5.2, which is a very challenging provision. So I would say for now, yes, there's a, a there's a, a, a large uh, proportion of Google involved in the DMA, thinking about the DMA, and it's it's more uh, technical folks than than uh, the lawyers for the moment, I would say. And if you look at uh, you know the DMA is, is with us for two years more or less new competition tool is longer um, if you and it somehow evolved uh, from the original proposal published in December um, 720 I believe 2020, uh, by the Commission I remember my my Christmas break was completely engaged with, with reading the proposal scrutinizing it and if you compare it with the final product, do you think overall you can be satisfied with uh, the, the legal formulas which have been actually refined and, and finalized by the co-legislators or there are some elements which are rather unfortunate or maybe not very not very logical? I, I mean, listen, I don't think now is the time to be worrying about, you know, whether something was uh, is the is a fortunate articulation or an unfortunate articulation or clear or less clear. The rules are what they are. And we have to operate with within um, the, the words as they've been written by the legislator. I do think that it is going to be important and it is reassuring to see the framework, although, you know, we haven't yet applied it um, to have uh, a continued dialogue 
with the commission and, and many other stakeholders for that matter around the operation of these rules. We are going to move from a, you know, there's a legislative, I had a similar Christmas, there's a legislative process as we try and understand what are the goals of this thing and how are these provisions, you know, changing over time. The rules settle, uh, the, the, the law is passed, we parse it, we try and understand it, we communicate with the commissioners to how we are intending to comply, try and reach some sort of common understanding, but that's not static. You know, and, and that will carry on, I think, for some time, that sort of engagement. And if you didn't have a piece of legislation of this size and complexity that also provided for that kind of ongoing, open uh, and constructive, I hope, engagement, then it would be rather difficult. But that is built into the law. And that, I think, is, is, is reassuring to me. So I think if we had got to this where we are now without that kind of opportunity for discussion, uh, then it would be more troubling to me. Um, I, I, th I think there are certain provisions within the DMA that are, as I've said, more challenging than others. You know, Article 5.2 uh, is a particularly challenging provision. It contains, you know, there's some overlapping aspects with other pieces of legislation. Consents uh, require a lot of uh, uh, engineering work by, by us and by others, I'm sure. So there are certainly provisions that will require more technical work. But my experience thus far has been that there's a common understanding with the commission of that. I don't think anyone is coming into these rooms where we discuss in a very open and frank and um, reasonable way, in my view, what the plans are, how one should read the provision. Um, the minds don't always meet, which is quite perfectly natural, but we have those kinds of conversations. And I think there's a, a common understanding of the places where the rules are most complicated and where we all need to focus our attention. I think you see some evidence of that, by the way, in the the structure of the workshops that have been launched by the Commission, which sort of suggests that there's an understanding that some of these things we need to discuss in a public forum, take lots of views so we can probably understand the right way to apply them in practice. And when we look about, uh, when we talk about regulatory dialogue, there are several kind of potential formulas about uh, calibrating or fine tuning uh, obligations for Article 6 and seven. Um, we obviously don't know yet what will be the final product in the United Kingdom. But from what we know now, at least from what has been proposed and what has been discussed, do you think the more bespoke approach is more suitable for this kind of new wave of digital regulation or um, the, 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 the DMA one is sufficiently flexible, allowing to liberate uh, the, or the, the, the real substance of obligations depending on each core platform services designated by, by each designated gatekeeper? I mean, you know, it's rather early in the process for me to, to judge one as being uh, better than the other. I do think, as I say, that the, the Digital Markets Act anticipates um, uh, a flexibility, I think, and whether you're talking about, you know, core platform services coming into the into scope of the law and dropping out of scope of the law, uh, you're talk, whether you're talking about the framework for regulatory dialogue, for you know, the commission to, to give you a view on your compliance with particular provisions, and that would allow you, of course, to, to talk about um, future product developments that haven't uh, been anticipated when we were creating the law. Those safeguards the framework at least is set out there we'll need to see how that operates i think there's there will be lots of questions there will be lots of there, you know one of the things that will be i think interesting for us all to observe is how do we allocate resource sensibly across these issues you know there's a as a, a responsibility as there always is i think for the regulator to pick its priority areas and, and focus on how we're going to um, comply with those rules in particular. So I think you, that will be interesting to, to see how that plays out. I think it's probably a, a bit of a, um, an unfair, maybe a false comparison to set the DMA up as a sort of, you know, very structured and, and unmovable code. And, and, and then, you know, what, uh, what seems to be emerging in the UK is something that is, that is much more flexible. I think both could be applied rigidly or, or flexibly, depending on the day-to-day the -day engagements between the companies and the regulators. So it's, it's early to say, look, I, it, what is clear, looking at, um, you know, anyone who reads a, a headline in, in a newspaper today sees how quickly some innovations in product development are taking place. There will need to be a capacity 
to think quickly about how our new regulatory framework applies to that. Um, my experience thus far is that, you know, whether it's the um, Competition and Markets Authority, the Bundeskartell Act, European Commission, within those agencies, there are smart and intelligent people who are anticipating that already. And the way to kind of get in, in ahead of that is to understand what is happening. So they ask us questions, right? People want to understand how large language models operate, right? How, how are we thinking about our launches? And I think those are perfectly sensible questions and, and quite reassuring because it just suggests the sort of far-sightedness that you hope for from, from the regulators. Um, I think the Digital Markets Act does have a lot of rules set out already. <laughs> So there's a fair amount of ground to cover. But, you know, I think if enforcement priorities are sensibly applied and, and uh, people think about this in a sort of systematic way, where are we going to focus our attention now? What's most important to consumers and businesses? Then I think that there should be sufficient flexibility there as, as in the UK or other, other countries. Absolutely. I agree with you that this dichotomy, the uh, comparing, contrasting actually UK uh, model with the EU is a little bit false and I, I fully concur that the DMA offers unprecedented flexibility and uh, opportunity to engage in, in mini meaningful construct for construct constructing um, constructive uh, dialogue or maybe even uh, polylogue. Um, but if you look at this kind of new wave of, of digital regulation, which envisages, so we are abandoning this more insulated approach to, to, to competition policy uh, using this metrics of welfare and price theory, but somehow try to incorporate, bro incorporate broader societal goals into it somehow. And do you think this di regulatory dialogue mechanism would allow to some to, to broader governmental agenda to be channeled through uh, through through these doors. And do you think the gatekeepers would be somehow uh, flexible with incorporating these goals in return of of of, of more um, succinct, maybe more uh, lenient? interpretation of some of the obligations there, there is no need to be not is there a necessarily need to be confrontational is it a zero-sum game or you can be more cooperative there's there's certainly no need to be confrontational in any of these discussions is whether you're whether the discussion is between uh, uh google and the commission or google and um and uh, a complainant who's had uh, problems with their their relationship with google i don't think there's any any reason to ever be confrontational um and I think what helps with those kinds of discussions is, is, is a couple of things. First of all, um, an understanding between the people in that kind of conversation as to what is the goal? What are we trying to achieve here? And you touch on that. I think you mentioned a couple of, of um, sort of industrial policy goals, potentially, or, or societal goals. You know, I think what's most helpful for the people who are in the room describing how that translates into the application of a particular rule and the question of compliance is what are the concrete measures of success that are going to frame our conversation here? I think uh, in my experience of, of doing antitrust or competition law for Google, the quicker you can get to that sort of understanding, the quicker you can um, uh, stimulate creativity in terms of product design and solutions, and the quicker you can come to a common understanding of what it is that you're trying to achieve. It gives you a measurability moving forward also, right? We've designed this thing together. It's intended to achieve these things. Um, we will report to you on these things moving forward, and that will be the bellwether for you and for us. And that's how you will be able to tell the world that this provision is working because these metrics attached to this goal. So I really think that that's, that's what's most important. You know, you start with this framework of the rules, you come to a common understanding of how that translates into concrete metrics that will measure your success moving forward. If you are Oli Bethel at Google, you report that to the rest of the organization. You make people very aware of, of, of the, the measures of success. You, uh, you can trust that your counterparts are doing the same with their stakeholders uh, at the commission or, or, or whichever regulator you're working with. And then moving forward, you have a kind of uh, an objective framework that is the measure of of whether this thing is working as designed or not. And I think that that protects both sides. That protects the regulator who needs to show that they're applying the rule effectively. It protects Google because you you make the application of the rules predictable. So 
that's really kind of how I think about these things. And it is, you know, how do you move away from the sort of, you know, contestability and fairness are hard things to measure in the abstract. Yes, but, um, you know, the great thing about working for a tech company is that there are lots of things that are, are, are very easy to, to measure um, by reference to an objective piece of data or a statistic. So you want to kind of move from one as close as you can to the other. And I think that therein lies the opportunity for success when it comes to the digital markets act. So let's get people together, technical experts together to try and understand how those measures ought to be defined. And then let's monitor those moving forward. So the, the, it only confirms at the end that the, 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 not including the, the mechanism of, of efficiency depends doesn't mean that we, we don't engage in technicalities. Yes, the, the, the technicalities will be with us. I think I think it's I think you have to have you know I, I, the rules are um, the rules are fixed for sure yes and we know that we're not talking about me um, measuring the effect on competition this is an ex ante regulation that's very clear and well understood at Google uh, but there will still will naturally need to be technical conversations let's say because you will need to have an understanding of uh, even the notion the famous notion of self preferencing yes. To identify an instance of self-preferencing requires a certain set of attributes being demonstrated in a particular service, right? Whether it's a marketplace, a search engine, a social network, what have you. And uh, so I think that it is absolutely inevitable that as those products all evolve, which they will do at the, the, the pace that they're evolving today, that you as a case handler will want to understand how I as an in-house lawyer am thinking about the application of self-preferencing to an evolved product that doesn't look like Google search engine in 2009. So I think you naturally have to have those kinds of uh, conversations, technical conversations, but you can move fast if as you go across those evolutions of products, you have a clear understanding of how you will measure the, whether or not the, 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 the neutral outcome has been achieved. Yes, there are gonna be those kinds of things that I think you can abstract away from a particular product design and say, these are the things that we will be measuring. So to, to take an example, if you think about uh, Article 6.3 and the, uh, the requirement for choice screens in some instances, you know, taking Article 6.3 6, uh, 6. and then say Article 13, anti-circumvention, you know that there is going to be uh, a need to measure a user's comprehension of a particular interface. We will be looking to, if the Commission has made it clear, uh, the, the legislators made it very clear in the, 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 the language of the law. That will be something that we need to pay attention to. You can start to think about the uh, principles of design that you would want to measure. Yes, have you tested by way of A-B testing how people are comprehending this particular user interface? Does the ordering of the options make a particular difference? There is a language around that, a technical language, that you can discuss now to anticipate how you will have the conversation, regardless of how that particular interface evolves over time. You know, the, the user interface, the choice screen appears on a laptop one day, the next day it's in a virtual reality headset, right? As yes, these things evolve, but you have a common understanding that you will want to see a metric that demonstrates that the user experience of that particular interface was neutral, right? And the ordering was assessed in this way. Um, and that, uh, you know, parity of treatment can be demonstrated in this particular way. So that's, I think, you know, you're never going to get away from wanting to have those technical discussions because a complaint will pop up in 2029, um, arguing that a particular uh, gatekeeper innovation violates one of these provisions. The first thing that's going to need to happen is have a conversation about how that particular innovation is operating. Right. How do people participate? What's the mechanisms that sit behind it? That will be necessary. I think in most circumstances, you're not going to get away from that kind of conversation, but it should be driving towards, hopefully, as best as we can, a common uh, and understood set of metrics that will tell us whether or not we're in a problem, problem zone. You mentioned Article 13. Can, I, I have actually maybe two questions. Uh, one more general, what's your impression about the very mechanism? Are you familiar with any other area of law or any other jurisdiction where uh, such, such, such toolkill, such, such enforcement tool, tool has been used and the, 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 the logic of anti-circumvention while being very pro-enforcement 
and uh, endorse in this wake by design scope of obligations susceptible for being further specified. The, the logic of anti-circumvention prov uh, provision appeared to be somehow you comply, but we, if, you don't, if you don't achieve what we, what we expect you to achieve, it means that you didn't. On one hand, so it's a little bit uh, too, ex too omnipotent, so to say, on one hand. On the other hand, though, uh, when you look, when you look the the rule itself, or the, one of the uh, paragraphs of, of Article Thirteen, it also requires the gatekeepers to comply with other uh, other provisions of the law, somehow mitigating, softening the the the, the rationale itself, because you can always refer to any other provision, binding provision of the law, saying that you you yourself ask us to comply with this as well as not to circumvent. So they are, it's par and par and essentially. Does it make sense? It, I, I think so. I mean, you know, I think what's interesting to me in Article 13, I mean, the, the notion of anti-circumvention just in the round is, is not so novel to me. Um, I think, we, you know, you have this in, uh, I'm familiar with it in uh, remedy orders, for example, the notion that, you know, they, you agree to uh, apply a particular change to address a, a problem that's been identified. And uh, you also make a promise not to do anything sneaky behind the scenes to undermine the effectiveness of what was agreed. This is a sort of safety valve that allows the, the negotiator, the regulator bit to um, be confident that they don't have to understand every future product implementation and every part of the defendant's business to build in all of the definitions to cover all of those potential circumventions. You say, well, listen, we all understand what the goal is of this. And if you do something that undermines it, that's a problem for us. So I'm familiar with the notion of uh, anti-circumvention. But what's interesting to me, I think, about Article 13 is the kind of layering on top that happens in this particular provision. And, and we've touched a little bit on, on, on a good example of this, which is the, the, the notion of neutral interfaces as a sort of called out instance of potential for uh, an anti-circumvention type behavior. And, and I can I can I can see. I can see the logic to that. I mean, what, what's really with the legislator, as I hear them at least, is saying to us is that there's a particular area when it comes to anti-circumvention that we will expect uh, the commission and uh, and you gatekeepers to be particularly sensitive to and to, you know, as I say, when you're discussing metrics and product design, to have a conversation in some circumstances around these kinds of um, design questions. So I think that is a, a layering on, an, an emphasis, if you like, to what I would consider to be a more familiar anti-circumvention provision. You know, thou shalt not um, circumvent the agreed commitments. Yes. And here we sort of go a little step further and say, well, thou shalt not um, circumvent the, uh, the, the, the rules of um, Articles um, 5 and 6, 7 for that matter. Uh, and, and here are some particular ways in which that could manifest. So I, to some extent, I, you know, I think it provides a bit of a, a helpful steer as to the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about. And we have read that provision um, as, a, let's say, a, an encouragement to work more carefully and more more regularly, and um, to 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 bring to conversations uh, our our behavioural uh, teams at Google, right? Our UX designers. We look at uh, that part of Article 13 and say, listen, this means that we now need to have a shared understanding with the technical experts at the regulators around what it means to have a neutral interface. And it's encouraging to me to see that when you look in the, you know, the UK, for example, other agencies also, the UK is a good example, I think, of teams being built out um, in a very public way that are designed to be wrestling with these kinds of issues, you know, behavioural teams. I noticed that some of the work that we're seeing now in um, in the academic community in Brussels is very much focusing on what does it mean to have a neutral interface? What does, how do we really translate these concerns around nudge and sludge and bias and et cetera, et cetera, these behavioral um, notions that we all have a kind of sort of superficial understanding of, but a few of us understand what really well, um, not me, <laughs> but how do we start to have a more informed conversation about those kinds of ideas? And that's what I think is interesting to me about Article 13 at least. Um, it, it, uh, underscores that particular mode of circumvention and says be ready to have those conversations and, and we are absolutely you mentioned behavioral scientists and ai teams i imagine now nowadays you can design uh, something which will look very neutral 
uh, visually for any behavioral scientist, but if underpinned by, by you know, AI evidence, uh, it will be quite, very difficult to unravel this, this spaghetti code, but you know, we will see how, how effective the mechanism will be. But so it's the anti-circumvention provision, this kind of pacta sunt servanda logic, yeah? Uh, you, you don't want you don't see it as 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 kind of a dis, disproportional uh, attempt to somehow to to force even to 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 pro promote even further this uh, rationale of of omnipotent uh, opportunity of the DMA possible given the procedural possibility to intervene anytime at at, at any conduct pretty much. I mean, you know, I'm going to probably going to give you a very unsatisfying non-answer to that. I think, as with all of these provisions, the will be the 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 time to judge how they're being applied in practice is not now, right? I mean, you have to look at these provisions and then look ahead and say, well, you know, in a world where you find yourself engaging in a six uh, a six three conversation, you uh, avail yourselves of the opportunity for regulatory dialogue. You invest a huge amount of time and and in engaging in a technical way, and then you have to roll on to another set of equally uh, in depth and um, uh, resource intensive discussions around the circumvention provisions. Well, yeah, I can sort of start to see how that might feel somewhat burdensome, but for now, you know, as I say, you have a rather familiar notion of no anti circumvention of these rules, and I can see how those two things can operate as complements. But you're quite right to flag that you know the more kind of fallbacks that there are in the law for uh for it, 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 let's say enforcement then there's a potential i guess there but rather early for me to say that it uh, that it's something that i anticipate as being a, a, a an overreach or, or excessive as of today we know uh, oliver that we or we often hear that whatever you try to design in terms of regulatory um, you know uh, mechanisms uh, nudging compliance or mandating compliance rather uh, the bigger the company is, the more organic you feel in the digital in the digital universe. The easier it is to adapt. I don't necessarily want to to move away from circumventing because it's more kind of juristic uh, term, um, mm -hmm. but to adapt and somehow to extract some advantages from the from the mechanism, whatever, however punitive it, it, it is it's supposed to be by the, the original designers, so to say. Do you think the DMA? Um, also offers the opportunity for, uh, let's say, uh, let's talk about Google. We can talk about other gatekeepers. Do you see it as an opportunity to enter the markets of uh, which are currently entrenched by 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 other ecosystems? But I mean, I think any opportunities that are created by the Digital Markets Act and it's a and it's a piece of um, legislation that's designed to promote contestability uh, and fairness. So you would hope that it will create opportunities for more competition. Any of those opportunities that manifest are in principle available to everyone. Yes, I mean, that's really important. I think it shouldn't be the uh, exclusive right of any particular firm based on you know um, their particular status to have an opportunity that's not available to them. That's not the operation of this, this, this legislation as I read it, at least. It's a you know, unifying act across uh, the European Union that provides a a, a range of um, new opportunities for all comers, whether you happen to be Google or whether you happen to be a new entrant in a garage in Newcastle. So I think that is clear. Uh, I think there's sort of two sides to that, of course. There's the opportunities that people will be able to avail themselves of, and then there's the application of the rules themselves to the, the gatekeepers who are subject to them. So on both sides of that, there needs to be an equal treatment. Right? So if you find yourself as Google, um, coming to an understanding of how a particular rule ought to apply to you, I think you can rest assured that that will apply in the same way to other gatekeepers. So insofar as Google opens up opportunities, then uh, other companies would offer up, uh, open up other opportunities. I think it would be unfair otherwise. And on the other side, to the, the point you're making about the opportunities that uh, are, are opened up to non-gatekeepers or gatekeepers who are you know not uh, the the young company in a particular area right you're operating qua app developer here rather than <coughs> qua platform provider um i think that those opportunities that are made available should be uh easy to take advantage of to avail yourself of if there is as i've been saying previously this clarity in the way that the rules are going to operate 
the faster that we can come to a clear understanding of how in practice we expect these rules to apply and how in practice we will measure success, the easier it will become for not just for Google, but for everyone to identify the places where they're not operating as they ought to. And where we ought to, you know, there's an opportunity here that we aren't able to avail ourselves of. So I, I do think that with clarity and applications of the rules, that will provide uh, an equality of opportunity for everyone. You certainly don't want rules, any of these rules, to exist in a kind of, um, in a sort of a small part of Brussels as a rule that is so Byzantine, so complex, that only the, the most well-resourced companies can ever understand what they are meant to do and how you can avail yourself of opportunities. I think that, like any piece of legislation, would be a problem. There will be some that require more of a technical understanding than others. Right? Some are somewhat binary. Right? No, some of the provisions requiring a change to contractual provisions, no retaliation clauses, those types of things, you can identify quite quickly. Um, the, uh, the effectiveness of a new consent framework is perhaps something that requires more of a technical understanding of what that rule requires, how it interoperates with other pieces of legislation that require consent. But the goal should be for the Commission and also for those subject to the rules to be able to articulate what it's meant to do and how you measure if it's working or not. Um, and, I, and I think that with that common understanding, my hope would be that the conversations around opportunities or an absence of opportunities that ought to be made available is something that you can discuss independent of the regulator. If this regulation is working well, I would imagine that I should be able to have a non-confrontational evidence-based discussion with someone who is using a Google service around the, a particular provision. I should be able to do that bilaterally. A, a well-working regulation should provide the framework for us in a commercial environment to have those kinds of conversations with, with players in the market to try and find a solution. And if, you know, if we haven't um, sufficiently explained to some set of stakeholders how 6.5 applies to a particular product that we've launched, then I should have the framework understood with my counterparts at the commission that allow me to be confident in my articulation to that company as to how it operates and how they can avail themselves of the opportunity. So, you know, that's a rather long way of saying that I, you know, again, you have this many rules and you cover this many, this much area, there is a chance that you need to have a, you know, an advanced degree in, you know, <laughs> competition law or, or uh, you know, an advanced degree in um, product design and behavioral science to understand some of the provisions, but then it's incumbent on us at Google um, with the partnership of the commission and, 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 and other stakeholders to try and extract and say, well, this is how it applies in practice. We all now understand how this regulation, this particular provision should apply. And we're trying to do that. You know, I think our engagement in the commission workshops has been an attempt to uh, in, a, in a public and collaborative environment to parse a particular provision and articulate what that would mean for us in a concrete form. I think that's the real opportunity is to come and have that sort of engagement now so that in 2024, 2025, 2026 uh, and, and onwards, we've come to a sort of understanding as to how some of these provisions, from my perspective at least, translate into practical design uh, rules, if you like, rules of the road for us uh, and the Google services. So there's a real opportunity in that engagement to come to that practical understanding to avoid the problem that you flagged. Because I think another thing with the, you know, the, the, with the, the problem that you've observed or the potential problem you've observed of, of complexity and uh, uh, an understanding of these rules only residing in an elite group of lawyers and, uh, and uh, uh, officials is that, that that is where I think you start to move to a more litigious environment, as you well know, when the rules aren't well understood and there's a disagreement as to how the rules apply in a particular circumstance, people debate and debate and debate, and then they find themselves in court. So I think there's a, having that practical understanding early on will reduce the chance of this, you know, as everyone says, this sort of armies of lawyers wanting to litigate every word. Well, let's understand what those words mean now in a, so let's come to a common understanding and then we'll reduce the chance of those kinds of disputes because those kinds of disputes often, you know, it's not a function of um, 
kind of, uh, you know, aggressive confrontational strategies, it can often be the consequence of a misunderstanding as to how a particular rule should apply in practice. So we should anticipate that and try to address it now. And speaking of litigation and not talking about specific cases, I, I wonder, um, we, we hear many voices saying that there is a potential uh, double jeopardy uh, situations uh, for, you know, concurrent application of the DMA in 102, mm. both by the Commission, and which is less plausible, but member states, which is more plausible. What is mm. your view on this? Is there any room for this? I think mean, we would hope to avoid that. Yeah, I think that... I've read recent um, remarks from the Commission saying that there will be a decision taken as to which way you go. You know, you wouldn't. It would make no sense to have a, um, you know, uh, uh, a, a DMA case on the one hand and then an antitrust case on the other. And I would say, in some circumstances, it will be clear that the ex ante rule is going to be the easier route to go because you don't have to go through some of the concomitant um, exercises that you would need to go through in a 102 case. So it's not something that, uh, for the moment. Um, again, that I'm uh, anticipating that I need to spend a lot of time worrying about. We'll see whether it emerges over time and I may well be proven wrong, particularly, you know, when we think about what's happening in the member states. I think a bigger, a bigger question for us at the moment is how do you ensure, uh, regardless of the piece of law that's being used to bring a particular case, how do you ensure that you are working towards a common rule book across the single market? I mean, that is a goal also of the Digital Markets Act. So whether a member state brings a case or a national court brings a case under the Digital Markets Act provision or under 102, these cases have the potential to touch on the same subject matter. Yeah, so whether you're talking about you know, use of um, uh, uh, business data by a particular platform, take that as an example, you would hope that if you have had those discussions with the European Commission, for example, and you've reached a common understanding, that, that would propagate uh, across the, uh, the, the other member states and the other authorities who are thinking about these kinds of issues. Um, where we tip into a world of fragmentation across the same issues, that will create um, complexity and drag and uh, I think real issues for companies like Google if there's one set of rules in one country and then there's another set of rules in another country and another set of rules in another country. So that's something that I think a bit more about perhaps, which is not so much having to face down a a 102 case versus say a DMA case and how would you you know run those two processes simultaneously it's more the question of abstracting from that if you have the same underlying issue being assessed uh, by a tribunal of some sort how can you ensure that we're kind of building a common understanding rather than taking different directions that's because these cases have real impact on how you think about product design and launches you know, when I, you know, I want to be able to go back to the people who are building these new products at Google and say, you know, there is a new rule. Um, we understand it well. This is the design principle that should inform us moving forward. And to some extent, I, I'm able to do my well, my job well, and to ensure that we can continue to innovate in, in a responsible and compliant way. If I do that once, you know, and and, and I can, people can rest assured that I have an understanding of how the rule, the new rule, operates in Europe. That's the rather basic question that people ask me. And if you have to keep coming back and say, oh, well, by the way, we've changed now a little bit for, you know, country X, and oh, well, there's a slightly different flavor here on country Y, what that means is you can't launch. You have to wait, or you have to unlaunch products. And consumers and businesses also sit at the end of this, watching products sort of coming to Europe late, or coming to Europe and then going away from Europe and all of those things happen where I think you have an unpredictable and fragmented rule book. So I think that's, that's how we, or at least I, think about uh, the, the, the goals and the, the, some of the, I guess, the, the risks posed by a, a fragmented application of some of these rules to what are essentially similar issues. So should we, should we infer from this that um, it looks that the, according to the, the, this vision, uh, a more, inter a more, more interventionist set of rules coming origin and discretional uh, coming from one single enforcer is more coherent and more kind of acceptable. However, however interventionist it, it is in its substance and however flexible the enforcer itself is in comparison to less interventionist prima facie, but coming from different sources, 27 or multiplied by two or three jurisdictions or private parties. Uh, each pursuing their own understanding of things, interpreting the provisions differently. You think it will be it, it's, it's more it's, holistic, yeah? 
It's a very good question. It's a very good question. I'm, uh, yeah, it, it will depend, of course. You, you set out for me there two factors, and then one is a multiplier of the other. Uh, if one, in, in, you know, in a scale of one to ten, if you set one intervention at ten, uh, that being, you know, the, the, high, the most interventionist, and then, you know, you set the other at one, well, that still comes out at ten. You know, so I think, you know, then you set, set it at two, but, you, you know, it comes, it comes in five different forms well, still comes out at ten. So it really will depend a little bit on the, the nature of these things and how they emerge. I think you can, it's not hard to conceptualise um, areas where, you know, it is still true in the European Union that we have national rules that differ. You know, there is, there is something of a patchwork in, in certain areas and we're all very comfortable with that. But in other areas, we try and tack to a, a common rule book. And I do think that the, the goal, as I say, of the Digital Markets Act, one of the, the opportunities for us as a company, when we look at the Digital Markets Act, is that it sort of strives for that common approach. So it's more for me a question of the policy goals of the legislation rather than, oh, well, you know, I would trade one off against the other. Uh, I do think that it is, generally speaking, easier to, to do any sort of uh, legal analysis, any sort of engagement with a lawyer like me is, is easier if you only have to do it once, yes? Um, but if that one-time conversation is a very quick conversation that leads to a terribly um, uh, counterproductive intervention, then of course you're going to have you know, concerns with that. Um, so I don't know, I, maybe the trade-off is, you know, if, in a particular case, I could probably give you a clearer answer, but you know, for now, I think you have to try and wait and see how those things emerge in practice. And uh, Oliver, uh, and if if we somehow expand this standardization, universality of 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 compliance, do you observe this so famously articulated Brussels effect? Do you think it will be plausible that uh, gatekeepers will somehow standardize their 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 mechanism, their business models, or it's it's just more kind of uh, I, I wouldn't even call it wishful thinking because I don't see any particular desire for 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 doing it for doing it for its own sake. But what's your opinion about this? What's the the, the implications of the DMA for other jurisdictions? Uh, it's a very good question. Look, I um I've only ever practiced uh, European competition law for Google, and that's always been my area of focus. Uh, I think you know we live in a you know it's a global community and, and people are observing what different regulators are doing. Every regulator has their own um, policy goals and objectives, and you know that the, the legislator operates in its um, um, right and proper way based on the, the democratic processes that sit behind it. So I think that you know it's hard to say that uh, things will naturally flow from from Europe to uh, other jurisdictions. I'm very focused on making this set of rules work here now. Um, I'm not really paying a huge amount of attention to whether I should be porting or advocating for rules to be uh, applicable in, in other jurisdictions. M my hope is that by being as innovative and creative and um, open and transparent and constructive in our engagement with the European Commission, that we can really find the best form of compliance for for the European Union for Google and for our products and services and you know what, what other people do with those observations is, is, is up to them I mean my, my, my focus is very on very much on, on trying to achieve that outcome but in terms of compliance rather or, or not on the regulatory side but on, on on the compliance teams does it really make sense to standardize to uni, uniform u, uniform uh, businesses or it's just uh, a, a, an easy snapshot template which which we try to somehow ease our mind by thinking okay we will have this will have broad implications I, I it's not one that i'm uh, sufficiently um knowledgeable or or, uh, or experienced to be able to answer to be honest with you i think that the the notion of a, a single rule book on any particular issue globally is, seems like a, a lofty a lofty goal to me. I think there's variance always in the rules that apply in different areas, not just in antitrust, of course. So as a compliance team, as a, as a lawyer, you have to accept that there will naturally always be different um, rules in different circumstances, and whether that's geographic or subject matter, that will always be the case, I think. And that's quite right and proper because uh, different places, different circumstances have different policy goals and societal objectives. 
So, you know, would it, would it be easier to have one rule and do it once, uh, perhaps? But as you yourself have said, if that was a, a particularly onerous and interventionist rule, then you perhaps would not want that to apply everywhere immediately. You might want to start somewhere, see how you can make it work, and then talk about moving to a single global rule book. But for now, as I say, um, I think, uh, you know, we deal with the uh, uh, Digital Markets Act as a, as a European piece of legislation. And, and, and my goal, honestly, is to focus on not so much on exporting the solutions, but really on achieving the best solutions for, for the European Union that I can. We're approaching the end of the hour. Uh, I, I have also a question about uh, privacy in book, not, not necessarily engaging into uh, pending, uh, pending cases, but uh, as far as they are transparent, it would be interesting to learn what you actually think about uh, the commitments. Um, but more generally, maybe, if you can elucidate uh, the programmatic advertising model um, is being criticized by so, from so many different angles, but it somehow allows to generate super profits. So, do you do you consider privacy sandbox as a kind of as a step further to disintermediate and envelop, or it is something which you you have to come to follow the trend because other browsers introduce it? Um, can you reflect upon these delicate things as, as well? I mean, when I think about privacy sandbox, uh, when you mentioned the, the the term, you know, my first thoughts, of course, go to the work that we're doing with the Competition and Markets Authority in this area, which you're probably familiar with. And I think what you can uh, see from that work with NHS is, is a couple of, in my view at least, a couple of interesting things. First of all, that there are uh, now and, and will continue to be difficult balancing questions between the privacy rules and requirements and competition rules and requirements. That balance is going to be a challenge for all of us to continue to think through. So I think that that's one thing that's become rather clear to me from our, our process in the UK. The other thing that's become rather clear to me, and it relates to the beginning of our conversation, is that there is a, a way through that kind of complexity. And what it requires is, is a few things. First of all, um, some humility to understand that if you're operating in an industry, you may not have all of the answers, uh, uh, but also uh, an opportunity for regulatory engagement so that you can um, explain your positions, bring evidence, and gain from the advantage of having a regulator help you understand other parts, other implications of what you're doing. And that's really what we're seeing in our work on the privacy sandbox with the Competition and Markets Authority is, you know, I think uh, a team of people, a technical team of people, less lawyers, more engineers, which is usually a good thing, working together on some of these tricky issues and trying to bring together different perspectives against the backdrop of technical evidence and understanding now, of quite sophisticated understanding now, to try and find the solution to some of these very difficult balancing questions. You know, when do you launch a change that seems very important from a privacy perspective that the privacy regulator has articulated to you as something that you need to pay attention to, but in a way that isn't hugely disruptive of the competitive environment in which you operate. And, and I truly believe that with Privacy Sandbox, you have the beginning of a, a template for one of what will be several issues that look like that, where a company like Google needs to come to a conversation, explain the different considerations that it's having to balance, um, provide the technical evidence that underpins some of the implications of going one way or the other, and to try and collaborate and to cooperate towards a, a shared understanding and a shared solution. So that's what I think about privacy examples. But institutionally, it, it, do you consider it as a part of the broader trend to try to, you know, to keep as much information or de de separate the, the publishers from the readers, uh, advertisers from, from publishers. Um, is it obviously, uh, we see it from, from pretty much all gatekeepers such that wherever they, they can uh, design this model, they try to do it even uh, to the detriment of other gatekeepers. They, uh, we see it in, 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 other, er in other areas. Um, do, is, do are we moving in this direction? Is it somehow inevitable? What was the main motivation of, of, of privacy sandbox? Not necessarily privacy considerations. It's more. Is it a broader technological trend, or it, because it looked that there were there was no immediate incentive to somehow to to make it even more refined 
from what you already have with, with programmatic advertising and double click, or is, is, it, is it a new start? So from technological point of view, I think I put together several questions, but if you can somehow bring some light on, on these aspects. Well, I, so I, I suppose like a couple of observations. First of all, I, you know, I think that the notion, and I'm not sure whether you're saying this or not, but the notion of um, Google at least looking to disintermediate uh, publishers from from their consumers is is what I probably would reject. I think that you know Google is in the business of making those connections as effectively as it as it can, and and has always had that goal. But more generally, the 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 idea of or the question of why would one want to make those kinds of changes and when and what's the goal here? What was driving it? It's as I said, you know, it's really a question of a balancing of these tension creating, let's say that. I don't think I was going to say conflicts, but I don't necessarily think there are conflicts here, but there's certainly a tension between on the one hand, um, a body of legislation and, and uh, uh, regulatory scrutiny moving towards a world of uh, protecting consumers' privacy. And another body of legislation, very well understood, which moves towards ensuring that the competitive environment is protected. And you don't do anything to undermine, you know, the the, the opportunities of other players in, for us, the uh, the open web, their opportunities to compete effectively. And what Privacy Sandbox tries to do is, as an initiative, is to come up with solutions for tracking a compromise that is able to satisfy both sets of goals, both objectives, even though, as I say, there's something of attention. What's very clear to me from that process is in those kinds of uh, product launches and product designs, you cannot operate in silos. You cannot just engage with a privacy regulator with one team within Google and then have another team engage with a competition or re regulator with one team at Google. It's impossible because you will move in, in slightly different directions and that's going to create difficulties and if, you know you may have uh, one regulator may be happy and then the other may not be so what you have to do is to break down those silos and, and we see a mirroring of that um in the uk right across the, the regulatory agencies you have the digital corporation forum and so too within google we treat this now as a technical challenge where there are sometimes you know not necessarily not immediately obviously aligned objectives but how do we bring them into alignment how do we explain our positions what we're seeing uh, and, and then try and find a common solution. Some of that, of course, to your very fair question, which I sort of read as part of this, which is, well, why would you decide to do this? What is motivating that? I, I would perhaps reframe it to, to what I have seen in the engagement with the regulator, which is, we think that we need to be moving in this direction. Here is our idea for how we might address that. Are we right? Yes, are our, are, are, is our understanding of the goals here uh, ICO, CMA, is this a common understanding that you share or have we got that wrong? And, and that's why I think this, you know, humility is important going into these conversations. You can't say, well, listen, here is privacy sandbox and we're now done and we think it is compliant. No, I, the conversation in a privacy sandbox environment is to say, this is, this is the technical challenges that we're facing here. We think we can resolve them in this way, but we need to check with you our diagnosis of the problem. We need to, uh, to, to, to test with you whether we have explored all of the product options that are available to us. And we then need to work with you to find the most uh, uh, effective and fair and reasonable way of bringing these kinds of changes gradually to the market. And we would rely on you, regulator, to help us do that because we don't want people to think that we've done this on our own. I think it's good to sort of tie, you know, to come to this to close our conversation because it really is a model for you can see that kind of approach, particularly now, porting to some of the DMA provisions also, where you come into a conversation and, 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 and say, with humility, you know, or less my understanding of Article 5.9 and 5.10, which are the ads, uh, ads transparency provisions, my understanding is that we need to achieve this and this. Here are the things that we can do. Here are the things that we can't do. What do you think? And if you don't have that end, you know, what do you think? then it's not a constructive conversation. It's a fait accompli. So I, I, you know, I'm proud of what we're doing in Privacy Sandbox and I, I, uh, you know, I evangelize it within the company as the right model, not for every provision because it's very expensive from a technical perspective in terms of the, the amount of time and energy we need to invest in it, so too for the regulator, but selectively 
those are the kinds of frameworks that we're going to need to establish for various of the provisions of the, the Digital Markets Act. And is the mechanism of com of commitments with the, within the UK competition policy, does it allow you all procedural flexibility to engage in, in the dialogue rather than just proposing uh, solutions? It may be yes or no answer because I, I'm mindful of time. Yeah, it's, it's totally fine. It is a yes or no answer. And the answer is yes, it does. You know, it absolutely provides for that. The, the, the benefit of the privacy sandbox agreement with the Competition and Markets Authority is it provides a framework for regulatory dialogue, right? That's exactly what it does. It provides a, you know, a, a framework, both in terms of the nature of the engagement, the topics, the agendas, the things that people should be uh, discussing, the goals that need to be achieved, but also a temporal framework, right? Because I'm very sympathetic to the notion that regulatory framework is just another way of saying regulatory capture. I see that risk, I understand that risk, and, and, and I have sympathy with the concern that you can build these kinds of frameworks for a healthy discussion where at the end of it, you may envisage the possibility of not reaching an agreement, in which case we choose to go away. And if we have to have some sort of litigation, we have to have some sort of litigation. But on the way there, I think there are plenty of opportunities for building, uh, innovating, if you like, in the ways in which these teams should be talking to one another to try and find sensible solutions. And to address the concerns that you know you touched on a bit, which is really comes from a place of, well, how can we have a how do we know what's going on here? Why did you decide to do this? A very important feature of this kind of regulatory dialogue will be one that you're starting to see manifest in the Commission workshops and the Digital Markets Act, which is an open door policy to this. The stakeholders are not just Google and DG Comp and DG Connect. The stakeholders in many of these questions of DMA compliance will be the academic community, will be um, it will be businesses, will be consumer bodies. I think there's going to be a need for all of those stakeholders to have a voice and an opportunity to be heard. And then you can hopefully get to a solution that we all understand and we, you know, whether everyone is happy or not, at least we understand how we got there. And, and, and my last question, Oliver, we have the tradition, you know, we understand that in digital regulatory environment, the new blood will, will, will be of decisive importance. And, you know, our students will be the next generations of those who, who enforce in, in, in real life this, these problems. We, we hear Mark Van Den, Van Den Vogt, uh saying uh, famously that the, this new wave of regulation will be paradise for lawyers and for also for engineers and, 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 and behavioral scientists and economists. What would be your recommendation for those who are just at the end of their study and who just maybe a little bit perplexed with all this rapid development? Is there any kind of golden rule which they have to adhere to, or maybe there are some niches which they have to focus their 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 limited time? I mean, I, I, you know, uh, me and Mike to, to say, I mean, I, I wish them all the best. I think it's an ex extremely exciting time to be thinking about moving into competition in, in Europe, if not globally. You know, the emergence of these new rules provides um, many opportunities to be at the vanguard of helping companies and regulators and society at large to understand the application of these new rules. So that's the first thing I'd say. I think it's a, uh, an exciting time to be coming out of education and perhaps moving into some of these, these jobs, these professions. If I was to give any advice, I would say that working on these types of matters, you, you, the kinds of things that will be important to you are a real appetite for um, problem solving, for a real appetite to engage in, in technical discussions, as we've touched on several times in this, this very engaging conversation. Um, uh, so I, I think if you have that interest in problem solving and uh, understanding um, technologies and fast developing technologies, then it is probably a place for you. Wherever you choose to participate in this process, whether it's moving into a regulatory agency or moving to a company like Google or um, you know, providing input as an academic or a technical expert, what will be very important will be able to, will be the ability to look at these conversations and put yourself in the shoes of other people. Yeah, I think one of the days of, of you being able to sort of decide that I am just a defendant lawyer and I will forevermore defend the interests of this particular client. There are jobs like that for sure. But in this environment, there will be many discussions like this. And my advice would be to, to, to look for those kinds of opportunities to engage and to, um, uh, be part of a community that's doing that sort of problem solving. So those, uh, those are my very high level observations. I don't know how helpful that is 
to the academic community. And other than to say, for any of your students or anyone who watches this, I'm, my door's always open. If people have questions about how Google's thinking about the Digital Markets Act, the opportunities that we offer for people who want to come and work with us, please don't hesitate to, to get in touch with me. Well, Lord Bethel, thank you very much for not being just you know formalistic and answering uh, the questions in in yes or no manner but for 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 being more open than one would expect it to be uh, it was a pleasure talking to you and thank you for for discussing this 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 these things within this within this hub delighted to have the opportunity Alice. thank you